Okay. So again, uh, I am Hamad Haddad. I am a third year medical student. I'm going to be giving you the half of the pulmonary review questions alongside Bushra. So I'm going to start with my part right now. So let me share the screen. Okay, so I'm going to start with the long anatomy lecture. So this is question one. Which of the following is true about the right main bronchus in relation to the left one? So you guys can unmute and answer or you can type it in chat. And if you have any questions at any time, please let me know. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of threes. I want everyone to answer. Okay, so the answer is uh, three. So it's shorter, wider, and more vertical. As you can see here, and this, this, is, this is your slide. The question was asking the right primary compared to the left one. So it's shorter, wider, and more. Vertical. It's a recall question. So you go over the slides and you can. Any questions? All clear? Okay. So question number two Which of the following is only found in the left lung? So it's only found on the left lung. Is it the cardiac notch? Is it the oblique fissure horizontal or the As everyone's saying one, you're right. It's the cardiac notch, as you can see here. Okay, let me put the... Uh, how can I turn the... This was fine. Okay, so you can see here, there's a cardiac notch right here. All clear? All good? Easy? It's an easy question. It's a pure recall question. Should I move on to the next one? Okay, so you're observing a doctor performing a bronchoscopy. As he passes through the, bronch uh, the bron bronchoscope down the trachea, a cartilag cartilaginous structure is observed separating the right and left main stem. What structure are you observing? Again, I want everyone to answer. Okay, perfect. Everyone's saying carina too. So here you can see the carina. It's found at the separation between both the right and left bronchus. All clear? Any questions about the question or anything on the slide? If you have any questions about the, uh, about the question that I sent, or if it's anything in the slides, please ask me and I'll explain it. All clear? All good? Okay, perfect. Fourth question. A four-year-old girl is brought in coughing and you were told by her mother that she was playing with beads and she aspirated one of them. So she, she, so she inhaled one of them. Where would you expect to find it? Okay. So who can tell me why this is the answer? Oops. Yes, perfect. So you relate it to the first question that I had. The right, the right main bronchus is shorter, wider, and more vertical, so it's more prone to stuff getting stuck inside it. Perfect. All clear? Amazing. Okay. Next question. Okay. So a patient was diagnosed with a pancreas tumor. Which of the following can occur as a result? Amazing. Good job. Yes. The answer is to Horner's syndrome. Okay. So who can give me the three things you see in Horner's syndrome? Yes. Ptosis. Meiosis. And what's the last one? Anhydrosis. Perfect. Yes. So in Horner syndrome, you get three things. You get ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelid. You get meiosis, which is constriction of the uh, constriction of the pupil, and you get anhydrosis or hemianhydrosis, so loss of sweat on one side of the face. 
Okay, who can tell me why Horner's syndrome happens? So what causes Horner's syndrome to happen? You can try it. Like, yes, perfect. Uh, compression of the sympathetic uh, trunk. Perfect. Okay. So next question. Now we finished from the first lecture, which is the lung anatomy. If you guys have any questions on that lecture, please let me know. And I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, before we answer this question, so let's ignore this question for now. Do you guys do you guys have any questions on the lecture that we just finished? The lung anatomy for your lecture. All clear? All good? Okay, perfect. So we move on to the next lecture, which is the plura. You guys already started answering this, but what do you think the answer is for this one? Okay, so the inferior border of the lung crosses which of the following at the mid-clavicular line? So the mid-clavicular line is in the front. Everyone's saying one, 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 one. Okay, perfect, yes. So you can see here you have the, the lung is crossed uh, at three points. You have the mid-clavicular line, the mid axillary line and at the scapular line. Okay, so at the mid clavicular line, you can see it crosses at the at the sixth uh, intercostal space. At the mid axillary line, it crosses at the eighth mid uh, mid 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 eighth uh, intercostal space at the mid axillary line, and at the back at the scapular line, it's the tenth intercostal space. Okay, all clear. Any questions? The lectures are pretty easy, and they're almost all of them are recall. So I don't think there should be anything that's complicated. Okay. So which of the, this is the second question. Which of the following is shown in this x-ray? Okay. I want you all to answer. Yes, perfect. It's a pneumothorax. Okay. Is it a right or left pneumothorax? Okay, perfect. Okay, so if, how did you know it's a pneumothorax? So what did you see that made you know that it's a pneumothorax here? Yes, perfect. So you can see that it's purely black. You don't see the lines of the of the lung itself. This is because it's all air. There is no lung here because the lung is collapsed. You can see the lung is collapsed here. So it's all all of this is air. So it's completely black. Yes, perfect. Okay, so you can see here. It's a pneumothorax, which usually happen if there's a puncture wound or anything. So the pressure from the outside pushes the lung and causes it to collapse. Okay, next question. Which of the following innervates the mediastinal pleura? Okay, good job. Uh, uh, the intercostal nerve innervates which pleura? Which part of the pleura does the intercostal nerve innervate? Yes, costal pleura. Good job. You can see here the costal pleura is innervated by the intercostal nerves, the mediastinal pleura, phrenic nerve, and the visceral by the autonomic nervous system, and the parietal by the somatic sensor. Okay, any questions? All clear? Okay, next question. Okay, so the pain and inflammation of the costal pleura, pleuritis, is transmitted by which of the following nerves? Okay, yes, intercostal nerve. It's basically the exact same question as the one before, but it's worded differently. This is to show you guys that you can word the questions differently for the same concept. Okay, all clear? All good? And uh, be familiar with the pictures of the x-rays because they might get them as multiple choice questions as well. So this is pleuritis because there's, you can see here, there's fluids at the bottom. So it's the inflammation of the pleura. And then there's also the pancos tumor. There's an x-ray for that. There's also the pneumothorax. There's an x-ray for that. So look over them and like familiarize yourself with them because they can ask you questions about that. All good? Clear? Mm 
Okay. So next question. The Raka synthesis is in, in cases where there is no fluids, only air. Where is the needle? Where is the needle inserted to drain this air? At which intercostal space? And which area? So you have air in your lungs or around your lungs. And you want to do tracosynthesis. Where do you insert the needle? Okay. People are saying one. People are saying three. People are saying two. People are saying one. There is only air. There is no fluids. So what do you guys think? Okay, the majority is saying three. And that's the correct answer. Okay, so you do one, which is 79th intercostal space at the mid axillary line when there is fluids. The way you can remember this is that fluids settle at the bottom because of gravity, pulls it down. So it's lower in the lungs. But air is at the top. So you put it at the top to like make the air escape. Here's the diagram to help you guys like figure that out more. You can see here at the bottom there's fluids. So you have to insert it at the 7th to 9th mid axillary line to drain it. But if there's air, if it's only air, you can see here, for air alone, you insert it at the top, at the mid-clavicular line, so right here, to drain the air. Clear? All good? People who didn't say three, people who said one and two. Clear? Are you sure? This is the last question of the second lecture. So if you have any questions about this lecture, the plural, ask me before I move on to the last lecture from my part. All good? Okay. So we move on to the last lecture from my part, uh, which is the innervation of the thoracic viscera. So the first question says, the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system that supplies the thoracic viscera is the case in which of the following? Okay, I want you to go all to answer. I want to see a lot of answers in the chat or unmute the mic, whatever you want. I only see three answers and there are 16 people here. Yes, it's one. Okay. So this table at the end of your lecture basically is everything you need to know because everything else you, you took it before in foundation. So it's all like it was all like a review for the uh, nervous system. But this table is what's new for this lecture. So if you memorize this and like you understand how parasympathetic versus sympathetic works, I think you're all good. So go over the lecture and like go do a quick review. But this is very, very, this is a very important slide. And I think most of the questions will come from this slide. Okay. I'm not saying ignore the other stuff. Of course, go over the entire lecture. All of it's important. But I'm saying this is a good summary to refer to because, like, it's everything that you will, like, let's explain in this lecture, but summarized. So you need to go to the slides, understand everything, and then memorize the stuff. Good. Next question. Excitation of which of the following causes decrease in the heart rate? Okay, people are saying four. Why do you think it's four? What does the dorsal motor neuron of the vagus nerve do? Okay, so which part of the parasympathetic is located in this area? Is it the fibers, the cell body, seven? Postganglionic, preganglionic. Are you sure it's post? Yes, it's preganglionic. So the answer is for the dorsal motor neuron of the X nerve because it's the preganglionic. So remember this table that I showed you guys? See here, preganglionic, DMN of the X nerves. And it's also in the actual slide here. You can see cell bodies of the preganglionic nerves are located in the dorsal motor. Okay, all clear. And then you can see here, whenever they're excited, anything that is uh, affected by the parasympathetic will increase. So parasympathetic decreases the heart rate, decreases for, uh, the force of contraction, stuff like that. For example, in the eyes, it causes it causes uh, it causes constriction, stuff like that. So 
anything that is in uh, excited by the parasympathetic, when the innervation increases, it gets activated. Okay, next question. Okay, excitation of which of the following causes dilation of the coronary arteries? Oh, Are you guys sure? Try to think about it more. Yes. Because why would you want to dilate your coronary arteries? Because your heart wants more blood. Maybe because you're running, you're running from something, you're fighting something, so your heart requires more blood. So you dilate the coronary arteries. So is this sympathetic or parasympathetic? Dilate, sympathetic. No. Yes. So yes, it is sympathetic. Yes. Parasympathetic. Because you, because your your heart wants more uh, more blood, so it dilates the coronary arteries. It's different than other parts of your body. Like it, it, it's not the all the vessels don't behave the same way. So you have to think about it when like when you approaching a question. Remember, it. like, would I need this when I'm fight or when, when I'm in fight or flight or rest and digest? So would I need it when I'm in parasympathetic or sympathetic? No, you would need dilation of coronaries when you're in the sympathetic, because you're running. Your heart needs more blood because it's pumping more blood. Clear? Okay, you can see it here. Why can't the answer be two? It can be two as well. Yes. I put that out there on purpose to see if you guys would choose one of the two. Yeah, both of both of them are sympathetic uh, nerves, as you can see from the table here. You have the thoracic thoracic flank link and the intermediate lateral. All of them control the uh, the sympathetics. I put it there to see if someone will like notice it. I was gonna mention it when I go to the next slide. Yes, so both of them, one and two, are sympathetic. So all of the sympathetic causes increase in heart rate, increase in force of contraction, and dilation of the coronary arteries. Uh, the thoracic splanchnic is basically a nerve that carries uh, the, the, someone that's unreasonable. Yes, is it your mic? Okay. So the thoracic splanchnic nerve is a nerve basically that takes the sympathetic fibers and goes to the uh, the viscera of the thorax, like the heart, stuff like that, to supply them with the sympathetic like innervation. It is post-ganglionic, I think. Let me make sure. It is post-ganglionic, yes. Okay. All good? All clear? That's it for my part. If you have any questions on those three lectures, please ask me. And then we'll move on to the other three lectures by Bushra. All good? Okay, so Bushra, I'll stop sharing so you can start sharing from your device. Does my audio sound okay? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, great. All right. Okay, <clears throat> you can see the screen, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, let's start. All right, everyone. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Bushra Rashid, and um, I'll be going over the first three lectures for pulmonary anatomy, practice questions uh, wise. Here's my email address. Uh, okay. Sorry, here's my email address and my colleague Mohammed's email address as well. If you'd like to ask us any questions after we've done the presentation, please feel free to reach out.
Okay, the table of contents. Okay, so Muhammad's already gone over his three lectures. I'll be going over the thoracic wall, the mediastinum, and the anatomy of the nose, larynx, and trachea. Again, if you guys do have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, you can add, you can stop me, ask questions in the middle, or you can uh, email me quick questions. That's all right as well. Okay, here we go. Okay. So the first question, irrigation of the maxillary sinus during an infection is a supportive measure to accelerate resolution of the infection. Which of the following nasal spaces is the most likely approach to the sinus infection? So let's break down the question first. Irrigation of the maxillary sinus during an infection. So you were talking about the maxillary sinus, it's gotten infected, and what we wanna do is we wanna irrigate it. Now what irrigation means is that you are, basically there's a flow of water into the sinus. It's usually salt water. Uh, and then the water comes out as well. So you do that for like around five minutes. And that's just supposed to help calm down the inflammation. Um, and if there's, you know, phlegm or something stuck, it can help drain that as well. Uh, what is the most likely approach to the sinus? So where do you think we can approach the maxillary sinus? Is it through the inferior meatus, the middle meatus, the vestibule, sphenoethmoidal recess, or the coeno? Let me open up your chats. Middle me eight is B. You are right. Let's. Mm, there we go. The answer is B. Middle me eight is okay. Right here. So the middle me eight is this is what it looks like right here. As you can see, the middle me eight is very very close to the maxillary sinus. Uh, so it would make sense for it to be uh, accessed through the middle meatus, but not just that. We're also looking at the fact that the middle meatus has the semilunar hiatus. And this, this, this hiatus is where we have the openings for the frontal, maxillary, and the anterior ethmoidal sinuses. And this, it's highlighted in yellow right here. So, yeah, you go in through the middle meatus. Uh, you would irrigate the maxillary sinus, and then that would help with the resolution of the infection. Next question. Uh, in assessing a deep laceration to the right side of the nose, the attending physician de determines that the cartilage on the lateral side of the nostril has been cut. What cartilage do you think is injured? Is it the accessory cartilage, the alar cartilage, the lateral or the septal cartilage, or none of the above? C, okay, a lot of people are saying C, the lateral. Somebody says they don't know, that's okay. That's why I'm here to teach you guys. Okay, let's look at the answer. The alar cartilage, okay. I'll tell you why that is exactly. Do you see in the question, the stem of the question, lateral side of the nostril? So we're not talking about the nose per se. We're talking about what's immediately lateral to the nostril itself, okay? Um, okay, right here. So the nostril would be right here in this area, right? So the thing that's lateral most to it is this brown area right here. This is fiber fatty tissue. This isn't a cartilage. So we move uh, upwards right here and we see that we have the minor and the major alar cartilage. And so the answer to this question would be alar cartilage. That's the one that has most likely been cut. Uh, that is most lateral to the nostril. All right, next question. 24 hours following a partial thyroidectomy where the inferior thyroid artery was ligated. Uh, ligated means tied off. So they clamp it during the operation. Uh, the, sir, the patient now spoke with a hoarse voice. Uh, and had difficulty breathing, which nerve was injured? Mm, okay, a lot of people are saying D. Somebody is saying A. Uh, the, the correct answer is D. So you're right, it is D. Uh, let me explain why. Okay, do you see? So when I, when, when I went over your guys' lecture, the content for the first two presentations, I didn't recall seeing this, like uh, like this particular topic there, but it is very, very high yield, not just for your exams right now, also for the board exams you're gonna be doing in the future, whether you plan on going to the US, UK. So I did think it was appropriate to add it to the slide. So when you whenever you have a thyroidectomy, for whatever reason, you need to cut off, ectomy means you're cutting off some part or either the full thyroid. In this case, it's partial. So you're cutting off a little chunk of the thyroid. Uh, what we do during the surgery is that you would ligate or clamp the artery. So we're we're like decreasing the blood supply to the thyroid itself so that when we cut it off, there's not there won't be too much bleeding, right? So you don't want the patient to bleed to death. Of course, you want to tie the arteries. Uh, 
the thing with the inferior thyroid artery is that it's very, very closely related to the recurrent meningeal nerve. Let me show you a picture here, right here. So the this yellow structure right here is the recurrent meningeal nerve. And this, the red one, is the inferior thyroid artery. So whenever you're trying to do anything to the thyroid, whether you want to remove the full thyroid or just a part, so a partial thyroidectomy, what you want to do is you want to clamp this. You want to clamp the artery. Again, so we decrease the blood supply. We don't want to lose too much blood. Um, in the event, because the nerve and the artery are so closely related, you might accidentally either damage the nerve or clamp the nerve. Maybe you didn't notice the nerve. You know, this it is a very common um, error that happens during surgeries. And so what you can do when you tie it off or when you damage the recurrent laryngeal nerve, since it is supplying the larynx, uh, the muscles of the larynx will either get pa paralyzed or they're not going to be able to function properly. Um, and so you're going to get a very hoarse voice. Um, so yeah, it, 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 the, the nerve and the artery can either be related in this way or, you know, do it this way, either way. Okay, next question. When inserting a chest tube, the main intercostal vessels and nerves are avoided by placing the chest tube immediately above the margin of the rib or below the margin of the rib. Uh, again, I'll give you guys a little bit of a context for the question. So um, we want to apply, we want to insert a chest tube during, uh, for, for a pneumothorax, right? For usually a tension pneumothorax. So a tension pneumothorax is basically when you have a collection, as the name suggests, pneumothorax. So you have a collection of air, pneumo, in the pleural space, which is the, 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 the area immediately outside the lungs. And so what tension pneumothorax means is that there's a one-way valve sort of in the pleural space. So air is going into the pleural space from the lungs, right? But air isn't able to escape the pleural space. So every time you breathe in, you breathe out, there's some air that leaks into the pleural space. Um, and then it just keeps collecting in the pleural space, uh, keeps getting bigger and bigger. And eventually the lung will collapse, right? Because there's no space for the lungs since all of the space is taken up by the pleural space. Um, and so what you want to do in that kind of a circumstance, because the air is not going to get out on its own, you want to place a chest tube, okay? And that will help you remove all the air so that the lung is able to expand to its normal uh, uh, size and shape. Now, where exactly do you place this chest tube? Do you do it above the margin of the rib or below the margin of the rib? You want to keep in mind the intercostal nerves. Let's look at the answer. Below the margin of the rib. Uh... Why is that? Let me show you this picture. Okay. Do you see how right here, this is our van, the triad. So we have a vein, we have the artery, we have the nerve. This runs directly beneath the rib in the costal groove, right? It's underneath. So if you were to place the chest tube directly immediately above um, the, the rib, you would be sparing the... Uh, most important neurovascular bundle. I know it says here like you can see that there's there's another neurovascular bundle here, but those are the collateral branches. Those are not as important. The main ones run in this space, like run in the coastal coastal groove, groove. Um, and so you would place it above. Um, sorry, wait, what? Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's 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 on me. Uh, this is this is wrong. It should it should have been above the margin of the rib, not below. I'm sorry for the confusion. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. So so this picture is pretty self self explanatory. You're placing it here to avoid the main uh, bundle. So you're placing it above, not below, uh, the margin of the rib. Okay. Next question. A patient presents to the ER with a 12 hour history of hoarseness of his voice coughing, and difficulty swallowing. So these are three separate complaints, okay? When you do a physical exam for the patient, you feel a pulsation uh, at the trachea. Uh, when you're palpating the trachea at the sternal notch, which is at the level of T2. You know the sternal notch? Uh, when you're palpating the sternum, the topmost the notch you feel right there. When you touch the trachea, you're feeling a pulsation there, which is not normal. Attached is the patient's x-ray. Uh, as you can see, the cardiac silhouette is uh, not normal. What is your diagnosis? So is it a thoracic aortic aneurysm? Is it abdominal aortic aneurysm? Dilated cardiomyopathy or none of the above? Let's look at the answers. 
Okay, a lot of people are saying A. You are correct. It is A. Yes, it is thoracic aortic aneurysm, and let me explain why. So, you look at uh, the fact that the, the patient has these classical symptoms, okay? What's really, really important to take note in the stem of the question is the fact that there's a pulsation uh, at the trachea. So whenever you palpate here at the at T2, you're going to feel a pulsation, which is, again, not normal. It means that there is some sort of an artery uh, that is present in this region. If you look at the X-ray, this is a dead giveaway for the fact that this is a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Why is that? If you look at the cardiac silhouette here, it's not, it's not bad. It's looking okay. It's a little bit, I would say it's slightly dilated, but it's not too bad, right? However, you do see this right here. On a normal x-ray, the, the aortic knob is maybe this size. It's, it's, this is the size of the aortic knob. But here you can see that it's so, so, so huge. So this, is, this definitely would be uh, some sort of a problem with the aorta. And in this case, if you look at the examples, again, this is not going to be abdominal aortic because abdominal is so much lower down. This is a chest x-ray. Dilated cardiomyopathy, I don't think so. The heart looks like it is a little bit dilated, but it, I, again, the aorta is what you need to look at. Um, and so because the aorta is, has ballooned, it's causing all of these symptoms in the patient. Okay. Uh, so the aneurysm most likely would occur in this spot right here. So as you can imagine, when this area gets really big and ballooned up, it would compress on the trachea, right? And that would cause the patient's uh, symptoms of coughing, of uh, hoarseness of voice, and it would also compress the esophagus. And so the patient is unable to swallow because of that. Okay. A five-year-old boy presents to the ER with shortness of breath and strider. He found out that he swallowed a toy truck. What structure is the toy most likely to get stuck in? Uh, let me explain what strider means. I'm not sure if you've taken that before. So it's basically a very, very noisy breathing. It's kind of like every with every single breath, there's going to be like this raspy sort of noise. Um, and strider would mean that, again, there is something uh, wrong with the airways. Let's look at what you guys are saying. Um, everybody is saying B. And you are right, the right main bronchus. And why is that? Because the right uh, bronchus is wider. It is uh, more vertical than the left main bronchus. And so everything's more likely to get stuck within. Again, the trachea wouldn't be, the bronchioles are way too small. There's no way a toy is going to go all the way there. And for the trachea, the trachea is uh, wider. So it is less likely for stuff to get stuck in the trachea. Whereas when there's, <clears throat> when the trachea is bifurcating <clears throat> to the right and the left, um, the right is what, uh, like objects would get stuck in more frequently. All right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> what is the correct order in which the bronchi divides into bronchioles? So we have bronchus, the main, uh, the right or left main bronchus. It divides to give us the lobar bronchi, bronchi, segmental bronchi, bronchioles. Uh, is it terminal first, then respiratory, or is it respiratory first, then terminal? Everybody's saying A. Of course y'all are saying A. You guys saw the answer. <laughs> terminal first. Absolutely, you're correct. Let's go over the anatomy for this. Okay. So this is the trachea. It bifurcates here at the carina to give you uh a bronchus okay the bronchus is going to give you this is this is the primary bronchus it will give you the secondary and tertiary so the lobar and segmental bronchi smaller bronchi bronchioles and at the end it's going to give you uh terminal and then the respiratory i know it's a bit confusing because terminal sounds like it would be the last but it's not don't get confused uh the respiratory bronchial is the last bronchial and then it will form the alveoli okay in an obstruction of the superior or inferior vena cava, venous blood is returned to the heart by an alternate route via the uh, a, via the azygous, the azygous veins, which might actually get dilated in the process. Which of the following structures might it compress as a result? So basically, this uh, this is critical thinking. So you 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 need to be able to identify where exactly the azygous veins are in the mediastinum and what structures lie in very clo close proximity to the azygous vein. So when the azygous vein veins dilate more than the normal amount, 
what do you think it compresses? Mm, I'm not seeing any answers. Okay, let me explain it to you then. C or E? The answer is neither, actually. The thoracic duct. Okay, let's go over the anatomy for this so that you're better able to understand. Okay, so let me orient you guys a little bit. So this is the heart right here, okay? um, These are the, the great vessels for the heart. This right here, number five, this muscular looking structure, that's the esophagus, okay? Behind the esophagus, you have uh, number eight, this structure right here. That is the esophagus vein, okay? And then this is the vertebra, and then the sympathetic, um, 19 and 21 would be the sympathetic nerves. Um, <clears throat> so if you, <clears throat> sorry, if you look at the mediastinum, this is the posterior mediastinum. If you look at it, look at it in a way where you see what structures are anterior, what structures are posterior, directly directly in front or di directly anterior to the esophagus vein, you would have the, th right here in the middle, you would have the thoracic duct. Okay, and so when the esophagus vein dilates a lot, gets really, really big, it wouldn't be impinging on the uh, thoracic duct. It's not, the thoracic duct is not visible in this picture, um, but yeah, so the answer is the thoracic duct. Um, yeah, I just want to emphasize on the fact that you're supposed to know the arrangement of the structures in the mediastinum as well, because they can actually, the, the question, most of my questions are actually from the University of Michigan, the website for anatomy. Um, and our professors are notorious for getting questions from that website. And so uh, a lot of their questions are actually based on, you know, the relations of the structures with each other <clears throat> within the mediastinum. And so I would advise you guys to look at it when you can. Uh, you know, so the zygous veins, what's anterior to that, and then what's anterior to that as well, uh, et cetera. Okay. Which mediastinal structure is most closely applied to the posterior surface of the pericardial sac? The aorta, the zygous vein, esophagus, thoracic duct, or the trachea? Okay, somebody is saying E. Okay, any other answers? C. Okay, C. Yeah. So you guys are right. It is C, the esophagus. We looked at. I'm gonna explain using the exact same image as before. But yeah, so you have the heart. Okay, and the pericardial sac. I'm assuming would be right here, right? Since this is the heart, and directly posterior to that is the esophagus right here. And that is why esophagus is the answer. Again, like I am noticing that uh, you guys are a little bit weaker in this, like the posterior anterior relations of the structures. I think it would be best to just review it uh, before the exam once, um, just in case, you know, uh, they, they decide to get questions from the University of Michigan. Okay. Patients with coarctation of the aorta often exhibit differences in blood pressure between the upper and lower limbs. Which of the following is the characteristic finding of this condition? And this is just a simple recall question. So uh, is the decreased blood pressure in both of the arms, the right arm only, the left arm only, or is uh, there a higher blood pressure in the lower limb? Mm -hmm. A, A, okay. Let's look at the answer. Hey, yep, you're right. So the blood pressure is lower in both of the upper arms uh, as compared to the lower. What we're usually measuring is a radial femoral delay. That's what it's called. So the radial artery, you measure the pulse in the radial artery for both the arms and then the femoral artery for the lower limbs. And usually the uh, blood pressure would be much lower in the uh, radial arteries than it would be in the femoral arteries in the legs. During surgical repair of the patent ductus arteriosus in a boy, the surgeon accidentally hits a nerve wrapped around the arch of the aorta that ends up causing hoarseness in the baby's cry. What nerve did the surgeon hit? Okay, a lot of people are saying A. Let's look at the answer. It is A. 
uh, why is it the left recurrent laryngeal nerve? Because again, we know, uh, first of all, whenever there's hoarseness of your hoarseness of anybody's voice, the first thing that should come to your mind immediately is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, again, the, 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 the relations of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve are important to know as well. So the fact that it wraps around the aortic arch, the fact that it uh, is very, very closely related to the inferior thyroid artery, all of these things are important to keep in mind because these are um, mistakes, not, not necessarily mistakes, but they can get injured in surgeries. And so you need to know this. Um, your exam. Okay, that's pretty much it for my questions as well. Why should the recurrent laryngeal nerve not come to mind? Why should it not come to mind? Not related to this question. No, no, no. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know what I said, honestly. But I, I meant to say, like, it should come to your mind. Whenever you hear the word hoarseness of a voice, the recurrent laryngeal nerve should come to mind. Uh, because usually this is the one, this is the main nerve that's supplying the muscles of the larynx. I know you guys are not supposed to be going over the nerve supply for the laryngeal muscles, and that's okay. Like, it's not for your level. But it is important to note that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve specifically supplies a lot of the muscles of the larynx. And so you're going to get hoarseness of voice if this nerve gets paralyzed, damaged, injured, anything. Uh, some of the muscles in your larynx would also not work, and so you're not going to be able to talk properly. Um, I think that's it for my questions. Hmm. Okay, and here's our last slide. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you guys have any questions, again, please feel free to ask me. You can ask me right now. Uh, you guys can email me with the emails that we provided earlier. Um, and we would love it if you guys could give us a quick feedback for the session. Because again, we we would love to hear what you think of the session and whether there's anything you would love for us to improve on. Um, since again, we are doing these sessions for you. And if there's anything you think we should change, we definitely will keep that in mind. Thank you so much. And, Thank you, guys. And one more thing. Uh, there's the question. I had to like do a quick research. The thoracic splanchnic nerve, uh, it is uh, it supplies the abdominal organs. So in the, that question that I had for the uh, dilatation of the coronary arteries, uh, the answer would be... Uh, Which yes. one? This one? This one. Okay. No, the one after. No, the no question after it. Yes. The answer for this... Where is it? It's the question about the no two questions after that. Yes. Okay. okay. So uh you, you you guys were right. One and two are both sympathetic, but the one that does this is the first one, the intermediate lateral nucleus, because that's that's the sympathetic that supplies the uh, thoracic organs or the heart and stuff like that. The thoracic splanchnic nerves. Uh, are sympathetic nerves, but they supply the nerves, they supply the organs in the abdo abdomen, abdominal area. So the, the intestines, the adrenals, stuff like that. So you're right, both of them are sympathetic, but the one, the correct answer for this is one. Okay, clear. And one more thing, it's it carries preganglionic, uh, the thoracic splanchnic nerves carries preganglionic to the abdominal organs. I just wanted to make that point clear because someone asked me a question about that. All right. And yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to the session. And we really hope that it helped you and you found it helpful.